Good afternoon, it's Tuesday, January 12th. I'm Giovanni Dennis with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're joining us online at onespotmedia.com. No arrests have been made in connection with Monday's major gun bust at the Freeport Wharf in St. James. 19 firearms, including six high-powered rifles and just over 470 assorted rounds of ammunition were seized. A multi-agency investigation is now underway as the police seek to identify the people responsible for importing the illegal items. It's reported that the police, acting on information, went to the port about 6 p.m. A barrel was scanned and found to contain anomalies. The firearms and ammunition were found inside a black travel bag in the barrel. In the meantime, the two former Jamaica Defence Force corporals who were arrested in St. Elizabeth on October 13 last year with more than 1,500 pounds of ganja had their $800,000 bail extended when they appeared in the St. Elizabeth Parish Court this morning. The court was informed that the case file was still incomplete. The court was told that the ballistic report and the forensic report were outstanding. Now, the two, Rowan Mendez and Robert Smith, were held at gutters in St. Elizabeth. The ganja had an estimated value of $6.15 million. The two are scheduled to return to court on March 8. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang has expressed outrage at the fatal shooting of four-year-old Chloe Brown in Freeman's Hall, Trelawney. Three persons, including a relative of the child, are in custody in connection with the case. Now in a news release last night, Dr. Chang appealed for an end to violence as a means to solve domestic disputes. In a subsequent interview with our news centre, the National Security Minister said the situation is now at an alarming level. The police will apprehend the perpetrators, but the fact is we need up more than that to stem this tide of domestic violence. We are families giving each other, you know, son kill the father, cousin kill the cousin. And in this case, a call between two brothers, and one brother sent someone to shoot up his home. The brother in hospital and then now lost the an innocent four-year-old. In fact, the killing of an infant is particularly traumatic, but when it comes to family members, it's more concerning as to the what is happening in a sad way. So many people have become so violent to each other, including family members. It's reported that shortly after 1 o'clock yesterday morning, Chloe and her father were at home when he was called outside. When he opened the door, there was a tussle and he was shot in the leg and Chloe was shot in the abdomen. Meanwhile, the police are again calling for persons to report family disputes as early as possible. Monday morning's shooting death of four-year-old Chloe Brown is believed to, stem, to have stemmed rather, from a family dispute. Head of the Trelawney Police Superintendent Kirk Ricketts has pointed out that an altercation at a birthday party Sunday night led the to the shooting. The thing is that the police was not informed about this. And uh, we believe that if we were informed last evening, we would have probably been able to intervene and prevent this tragic circumstances. Now, a family dispute in St. Mary last month resulted in two brothers being killed and their mother and sister now facing murder charges. The St. Mary police had also called on persons to utilize the counseling and dispute resolution facilities available before disputes turned deadly. To other news now, the College of Agricultural Science and Education, CASE, is planning to accommodate students for boarding as its exam period approaches. But the students say financial constraint is a challenge and they are scared to travel to and from the institution due to the risk of contracting COVID-19. It's why they are appealing to the college to urgently address the matter. Sandy Williams reports. While several boarding schools have been experiencing a smooth resumption to face-to-face -face classes, the College of Agricultural Science and Education case in Portland has hit a bump in the road. Due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the school has been utilizing online classes.
But on December 18 last year, the students received an email from the school advising them that they would have to do their exams face-to-face -face starting January 18. And that is where the contention emerged. The students say they are concerned. Many of the students have to travel long distances to and from the institution. It is why the school has urged those students to board on campus, but... While some can afford to board, some of us cannot because we have our kids or our family at home that we have to travel even if it is from far to get to college on a daily basis. On a regular basis though, we normally depend on school in order to leave our kids during the daytime. Oshin Morgan, who is a third year student at Case, says she's fearful of contracting COVID-19 due to the increased exposure while traveling to and from the institution on a daily basis. We don't want to go out there and contract the virus and then bring it home back to our families. Persons have underlying illnesses. The virus maybe seems like it is going down because of the amount of testing that is being done on a daily basis. Miss Morgan says the matter was brought to the Teachers College of Jamaica, TCJ, as well as a petition was signed by more than 7,000 students. However, they are yet to receive a response. We are scared of going out there. We are saying that TCJ do something for us. Do something, try and assess us some other way. Our life is at risk when we have to go there like that. I have communicated with here one, here two, here three, here four, and other students from other colleges, and we all have the same complaint. So we're saying that the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Minister of Education, please can you just step in and do something on our behalf? Sandy Williams, TVJ News. Uh, two policemen were injured and a service vehicle damaged during an attempt to turn off an illegal party in Portland Sunday night. The Portland police have since arrested and charged a 24-year-old man for breaches of the Disaster Risk Management Act, being armed with an offensive weapon, malicious destruction of property, indecent and abusive language. Now it's reported that the Manchineal police were conducting a routine patrol about 10.15 Sunday night when they observed a party in progress at a premises in a Sunshore district with about 150 patrons in attendance. While terminating the party, the lawmen saw a man with a bulge to his waistband. Now he was later identified as Kenroy Johnson, O.C. Big Boy, a 24 years old laborer of Barracks District in the parish. Now he was accosted and whilst being searched, it's understood that Mr. Johnson started to behave boisterous. A kitchen knife was found in his waistband. Now persons in the crowd became enraged and began throwing stones and other missiles at the police injuring the two officers. The angry mob also damaged the service vehicle. Now, Mr. Johnson was subsequently arrested and is scheduled to appear in the Portland Parish Court to answer to the charges. The owner of the premises is also being sought by police. And it's now time for a break here on the Midday News, but please stay with us. We'll have much more when you return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Nine, two additional COVID-19 deaths have been recorded in the island over the last 24 hours. The deceased are a 69-year-old man from St. Anne and a 43-year-old female from St. Thomas. This has increased the country's death toll to 315. Meanwhile, the country's COVID-19 case count now stands at 13,760. 123 new cases were confirmed on Monday. Their ages range from one month to 93 years. The health ministry says 82 patients remain hospitalized with the respiratory illness. Six are critically ill. In the meantime, the St. Andrew Municipal Cooperation Building is closed for deep cleaning following a positive COVID-19 result of a staff member. The result of the work was made known on Monday. The corporation says members of staff who came in contact with the infected person are also being quarantined at home and will be tested by the public health authorities. It says that normal operations will resume on Wednesday. 
The first rollout of a vaccine in Jamaica might not happen in April as projected by the Ministry of Health. This as the government is now actively exploring other options outside the COVID-19 global access facility, COVAX. Shamela Pullen tells us more. Despite several countries administering COVID-19 vaccines, the global effort to inoculate against the virus may be off to a slow start. It's the reason President of the Medical Association of Jamaica, Dr. Andrew Manning, is supporting the move for the government to pursue vaccines outside of COVAX. COVAX would only aim to um, vaccinate about 16% of all population by the end of um, by the end of this year, 2021. Of course, you know, vaccinations would have to continue after that. But it's a question of getting vaccines to vaccinate as many as your population as you can. Dr. Manning added that care must be taken to ensure second doses are given from the same vaccine. He's encouraging a sensitization campaign before the actual rollout. The key thing in this is that you would have to explain to the patient the importance of sticking to that same kind of vaccine. And generally, you would organize it so that if they go to a particular clinic or center or doctor to get the first dose, then they go back to that particular doctor for the second dose. Um, and there has to be an educational campaign. Dr. Manning has also discouraged the practice of vaccination being done on the black market. They need to cease and desist. When you have a, um, a COVID-19 test and you buy it, the, the accuracy, and I can tell you, I've had tests that have been touted as being, say, 97% sensitive. And when you do the validation test here, they're less than 50%, so much less as 30%. So really, unless the test is validated, you don't know how accurate it is. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. Still on COVID-19 vaccines, the Moderna vaccine appears to give people at least a year's worth of protection from COVID-19. Now, that's according to the biotechnology company's chief medical officer, Tal Zaks. Vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer were both granted emergency youth use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration. Now, according to Zaks, Moderna will test to see if a third dose of the vaccine will result in longer protection. Now, the two needed doses of the vaccine are given about a month apart. Now, since this is a new product, officials aren't sure how long they will last. New Year and stricter measures. The National Water Commission, NWC, announced last year that it will start enforcing a widespread disconnection drive to collect arrears. While they facilitated write-offs last year, this year, President of the NWC, Mark Barnett, says they will be collecting money owed. We have not been really utilizing aspect of our statute to really enforce compliance, and I think uh, our customers, at least some of our customers really, have taken us for granted for too long. So we just need to change gear and exercise all aspects of our statute to enforce compliance. He added that the NWC will pursue legal proceedings against individuals who have not paid their bills along with the disconnection drive. We are doing everything simultaneously. So we are disconnecting and we are continuing with that effort right through the year. And we will be taking the next step in terms of those who have not responded. Either you have not responded to uh, pay down what you owe or you have not made any effort to make arrangements. We have been giving very liberal, if you will. He's encouraging residents to do checks when they see an abnormally high bill. We know customers, when they see a high bill, the first thing they want, the, the, the first assumption is something is wrong with the meter. And so nobody checks their premises. I've had almost 90% of those customers who call me to say, oh, my billing is wrong. I said, hold a second, did you check your plumbing? No, I, I don't know what to check. So when we do checks, there are leaks in people's walls, there are leaks all around the place. So those are the responsibility of those customers, and it is one of the first things that we would encourage. He was speaking on Poor 106's morning agenda this morning. 
In news overseas, security preparations for next week's inauguration of Joe Biden in Washington have accelerated, but it may not be the only place in the country susceptible to violence in the coming days. Now, an FBI bulletin warns of the potential for armed protests at all 50 state capitals. More from the CNN. With the capital and the country still reeling from last week's violence. An internal FBI bulletin warns armed protests are being planned in Washington, D.C. and at all 50 state capitals in the days leading up to inauguration. The bulletin, first reported by ABC News and obtained by CNN, also says the FBI is tracking threats to harm President-elect Joe Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. They're saying this because they have intelligence that indicates this level of threat activity, and that is very concerning. Washington is under an emergency declaration through January 24th, the mayor urging people to stay away. The inauguration poses several unprecedented challenges that exceed the scope of our traditional planning processes. But in the midst of such heightened alert, Acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf has resigned. Wolf, who served in an acting capacity for 14 months, cited ongoing and meritless court rulings regarding the validity of my authority as Acting Secretary as the basis for his exit. FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor will step into the role during these crucial days ahead. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, House Democrats formally introduced their impeachment resolution, charging Trump with incitement of insurrection. A vote is planned for Wednesday. We have to make sure that we are standing up for what is right and for the Constitution. To news and sports now, the matter involving national under-23 footballer Kyle Butler and his father, Craig, came before the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on Monday. The case arose from a much-publicized dispute late last year when the younger Butler accused his father of physical abuse. Karen Madden has this follow-up. It's a case of charges and counter-charges and two accused and two complainants. It started last November. In a series of tweets, Kyle Butler shared pictures of cuts and bruises he claimed were inflicted by his father. Craig Butler then accused Kyle of attacking him, resulting in both appearing before the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on Monday, charged with unlawful wounding. The judge heard arguments on both sides before referring the matter to mediation. But TVJ Sports has learned that Monday's court appearance did not go without incident. This after the younger butler told the court that he wanted access to his father's house to retrieve personal items. But the elder butler told the court that his son had no property in his house and would not be allowed in. This resulted in a short argument between attorneys Christopher Townsend, who represents the father, and Tom Tavares Finson, who represents the son. It was then proposed that Kyle's sister, who lives with their father, would check for any items belonging to her brother and take them to him. That proposal satisfied all parties. The judge also placed a gag order on both butlers, forbidding them from speaking to the media or making any social media posts. With both parties agreeing on mediation, the matter was again set for mention on March 11. Karen Madden, TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Giovanni Dennis. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.